week by God. It'll also give you recommendations and best practices. So really good tool to even optimize your storage. Like hey, here's some places that you could be, you know, um, saving your costs. Just, and we have a free and a paid version on uh, Storage Lens. Happy to, you know, sit with you offline later after this to just kind of go over this if you have more questions. Thank you, Chef. So now that we have uh, talked about importance of data and we also talked about data observability and the, the pillars of data observability, let's move along, right? Now let's talk about the modern, modern data strategy which I was talking about at the start of the session itself. So modern data strategy in action. The modern data strategy helps your uh, data sources to connect to the people who will be consuming it, whether they are people, processes, apps, devices, and then anything in between. And all the IT building blocks are going to help you do that. And AWS has purpose-built services to give you that, uh, uh, give you that uh, uh, handle to, uh, to work with your data itself. So we have analytics space, we have purpose-built databases, we have data lake solution, we have visual data visualization tools. We also have machine learning purpose-built tools which are combined and integrated with our data analytics tools. We also have central data governments, we have catalogs, uh, where, through which you can manage your data lifecycle and schemas. And then we also have data lakes, like we are talking about, and I'm going to cover some of these with the specific technologies and how to use them. And then we are going to use this as a scenario as well. But you can build, pretty much you can build a data lake on AWS as well. And then anything in between, uh, we, have, we have all types of services on the approach. So, what are the different pillars of uh, uh, AWS, AWS to help data strategy pillars, right? So in this case, I was talking about a scalable data lake. Like I said, we have purposely databases for relational, non-relational databases, including graph database and all. We have blockchain database as well, quantum ledger databases. And then beyond this, we also have a lake solution where we can use S3. We have uh, some of the other tools as well, which I'm going to talk about, like Blue for the IKEA, Redshift for data warehousing. And then you can apply the visualization tools on the top, like Athena or QuickSight, depending upon where you are and where your data is. Then we also have, uh, and these tools are purpose-built for performance and cost. Uh, being AWS uh, market leader in the cloud space for 15, 17 years now, S3 is the, the oldest service we have in the market. 17 years? Yeah. 17 years, yeah. So, so we have these services and we have that experience. And like our CTO says, there is no compression, compression and outcome for experience. So we have that experience where we have these kind of tools which we are purpose-built for performance and cost optimization. And of course, we have serverless options too. So if you don't, as a startup, I understand you don't want to manage your infrastructure and you want to make sure like you are, you are zeroing down on your business problems rather than worrying about this undifferentiated heavy lifting which you have to do around the infrastructure itself. So we have serverless options. In that case, you don't need to manage your servers, server lifecycle, upgrades, patching, and all that. We take care of that for you. And then everything, like AWS gives you this ecosystem of analytics, machine learning services. So your data is never out of, like you have to move data between systems and you have to really figure that out because it's so integrated. Or, dis dis or, or disintegrated at the same time. You can take that decision. But we give you those bells and whistles where you can combine all these tools together to apply your modern data strategy on top of it. And you can bring in any third party tools as well. We don't block you. Your data is your data. It's sitting in S3 or any purpose built database. You can bring in third party tools through our marketplace offering as well. And then building machine learning. So most yeah, yeah, machine learning, yeah. Machine learning, yeah, talk about yeah. Yeah. So most of the tools like I'm talking about, like Redshift, uh, S3, SageMaker, all of these are in like they are interconnected. So we have built-in features through which you can combine it with SageMaker, which is our uh, build, deploy, machine learning solution platform or service platform, which have a lot of other features. I'm going to talk about that as well in the coming slide. But the subtle point here is you can combine those machine learning capabilities within these tools out of the box. So now that we have talked about uh, modern data strategy, how you're gonna work on this strategy to implementation, where you see the results. So one way which I think we can do is, we can apply data lifecycle and the template it provides, and, and execute on that strategy to come up with the architecture you really need. 
So let's talk about that data life cycle. So with a raise of hand in the room, and maybe we can distribute a paper and take a two to five minute pause. Can you can you draw a data life cycle for me? What you think it should be? Or maybe we can speak to it. We don't need to draw it. If if you can raise your hand and just tell me like what those stages are. I can tell you what might be. Uh, if I'm not sure, I will keep it um, because S3 has different kind of storage. So uh, in archive type storage where you may not even need it, you can you have to store at least for one year. So if I want to keep it at least for one year, it's very low cost. And then there are options if you if you really need it and you can expedite it, uh, depending upon how fast you can have access to it. Right. It's one part of it. And but also what? in S3, there is an option. If you are not sure how your data is being accessed, it automatically observes it and categorizes right. it into and then put it into the appropriate storage type to Everything for charge for yeah. Thank you. Maybe I'm just adding on to what uh, Manish said. I think that's a very good point about a storage life cycle. But I think we take it one step above, which is data life cycle. And you think about I have data sources either coming from Salesforce or coming from Google Analytics, maybe from my IoT devices. These are just like raw data. How would we actually make it usable from a or a business analyst, or a data analyst, or even a data engineer. So if you take it one step higher and think about my data, where it's coming from, how I consume it, how does that data life cycle data pipeline look, looks like? Yes. Source and destination. Yeah. Then there are key and the in between like key pipelines and yeah. ETL to modify and yep. create tables. Good so yeah, I mean you're all right, right? So typical data life cycle starts with data ingestion. So you need to, before before you do anything with that data, or exchange it, or store it, or, or work on the life cycle of that data itself, you need to ingest that data. And data is not with you, it's with your application, or users are interacting with your system and you're getting that data, right? So data ingestion is probably the start of this life cycle, whether it's internal or external. The next, you're gonna stage that data set. So you have to stage it somewhere in a raw format before you act on it or do something with it. Because the velocity and variety coming in, uh, you can run real-time analytics, you can generate insight, but you also want to store that raw data format somewhere. So staging systems are where you're gonna store it. And then from there, what you do is you use that raw data format and clean it. Because in some cases, like I'm, 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 I'm particular, particularly about this, like you have to clean your data set. I mean, of course you can receive the raw data set, but it might not be ready to consume in, in its raw form in some cases. And from there, what you can do is once it is cleaned, you can put it back into the staging system, or you can push it to some of the BI tools or data warehouse or any other spaces where you can do more analytics and machine learning on top of that data set. And once the data set is stale, or you are not frequently using it, probably you are going to archive it. So you push it to the archive data archiving system. And then you go through the same loop again and keep working on this. Do you think I missed anything in this, or you are seeing any other step which I might have missed or misstated, which should be part of data life cycle? So, uh, versioning of data, then yeah. if we are changing the data, we might want to keep the originals. Yeah. So, a staging system, cleaning system, or analytic system, you're going to maintain that versioning that is out of the box, right? But overall, as a whole, as a life cycle, did I miss anything? All those nuances are built in into the tool itself, are native. Okay. Um, first of all, compliance, for example, uh, for addressing healthcare and data, for example. Yeah. And the second thing is, where is the decision making? I see analysis and visualization are. Machine learning is there as well. Okay, that's included in the form. Yeah. And then, uh, some of those horizontal services like scaling, performance, metrics, logging, uh, and then security and compliance, I think that is given. Any system you're gonna be data ingesting in, you need to make sure you have security and compliance in place. So those are given. 
but it's specifically for the data itself, the life cycle, because you're not gonna change your data to do something for compliance. The data as is, you have to store it properly, mask it, or some of the other things you're gonna do, but they are not overall life cycle. They're not part of, they're not changing how the data is gonna look like, or adding to the value itself as a life cycle. They're integral part of each stage, and you need to think about those anyway. Scaling, reliability, disaster recovery, security, and compliance. And cost optimization as well. How you how do you store it? Which format do you store it and all? Uh, data preparation or manipulation can be done by ETL or SageMaker. Yeah. Staging to cleansing. So we're gonna talk about that. For SageMaker, we have to put all the data onto the instance to change it and then save it back yeah. again. But is this possible using ETL that we don't have to change it and it can change it? It's up to you what your use case is, right? So if you're using machine learning engine to generate certain insights, yes, you can use that to create efficiencies and stage it back into the system. Then you run a different model to generate insight. You can always use ETL tools, which are here over like extract transform load. You can use that to stage and clean and put it back in the staging system again and keep running on it, right? Different processes, whatever you want to work. So, Data, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do with the data set itself. Between staging and cleansing, I'm thinking you will be doing multiple cycles before you put it into analytical system. And your uh, staging and cleansing boxes, they're gonna stay year over year, and might maybe have, they are the building block of your data lifecycle. And they're gonna stay as is, because you might change analytical tools. Today you are using Tableau, tomorrow you might use QuickSight. But your data itself in S3 or databases are going to stay there, relational versus non-relational, or object storage versus file storage. Similarly, for visualizing like machine learning, you might change. Today you are using SageMaker. Tomorrow might, you might use your own models running on EC2. But data is still going to stay in S3. You're going to stage the data set again there, and you're going to access it from there. So staging and cleansing are really important steps. Yeah, answer your question, or for accurate. I think uh, one of the questions that I was wondering that I know how it will work on SageMaker, but in in ETL we can create a notebook. So do we need to create the notebook, or is it possible without creating the notebook? I think you're talking about Blue Studio notebook, and you're talking about SageMaker Studio notebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So SageMaker Studio notebooks are specifically for ML engineers right. who want to interact with a specific ML framework within the notebook itself. So Studio is the Machine learning IDE, and we have, and we're going to talk about that on the slide. I'll, I'll briefly speak about that as well. We have around 40 features. They are all integrated in that IDE, whether data handler, feature store, um, data uh, uh, clarify as well for monitoring and uh, detect the bias in the model and the data set itself. All those are integrated there. So ML engineers don't have to leave that studio IDE to go anywhere else. Glue Studio, uh, uh, which we are talking about, Glue Studio notebooks, they are specifically for data engineers. Okay. They are not running any machine learning workload. They are not interacting with those Boto 3 SageMaker libraries to do anything. They are specifically just looking at the data set and maybe cleaning it, maybe maybe creating a new column or doing things with it, right? But they are not interacting with those ML tools which are available in the uh, Studio SageMaker notebook. Sure. Uh, I mean, do we have anything to add on this? No, I think uh, what, what you described is uh, absolutely right. <coughs> so yeah, I mean, those are like, I know sometimes AWS services might be a little bit confusing, but they are very purpose-based, specific user personas we address. And if you dive a little bit deep, you will see there is a value to, each tool has its own value. Uh, can you do some of those things, like data cleansing using studio notebooks in uh, SageMaker? Yes. But it's not gonna give you those built-in transformations and hundred other things, you have to write your own piece of code. But Clue Studio is gonna give you a lot of that. Uh, and to add on to what Manish says, usually not uh, Clue Studio or SageMaker Studio. If you are doing machine learning, usually it is both. So you will have a data engineer who's responsible for taking in the data, maybe combining the data set, cleansing it, preparing the data using Clue uh, Studio to prepare the data. And ultimately that could feed into an S3 bucket that they machine learning engineer will use SageMaker to access data in those S3 buckets to do further machine learning uh, algorithms on it. So they are just used in different portions of the pipeline and it's not like one or the other. It's like what Manish said, it depends on what the uh, particular engineer is trying to do and what are the tools he needs access to, to do. So. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. So, there might be many questions you can ask yourself when you're designing an ingestion system, but here are some of them, which I feel really important for your startups. So where is this data coming from? Is this a vehicle screen data? Is it coming from your product feedback, survey feedback? Is it coming through text document and PDF, which you are manually entering in your system? You need to really know where the data is coming from. Because what do you do next to ingest that data is really important to know where the data is coming from. And, and also think beyond this, like today you know data is coming from these two systems, but think about what you're developing as a system and who are your customers, and think about where in the future the data can be coming in from as well. Today you might be developing a desktop app, tomorrow you might have a mobile app, uh, IoT device. So have you figured that out, like where your business is and business strategy is going to be, and how you're going to be ingesting that data is really important. Next, what type of data you're ingesting? Is this document, images, files, uh, JSON file, or is it binary file? I don't know. I mean, I'm just putting it out there. You need to really know what type of data you're ingesting, and in future as well, how your business use cases might evolve, and how often you are uh, ingesting this data. Do you need to run that server all the time, 24/7, or can you use a cloud provider like AWS to auto scale it up and down depending upon where your load is? So think through all this, uh, these are really important to know. So one of the tools, and of course we have many, you can use transfer file, you can have SFTP, you can have files, you can have uh, literally those suitcase type of boxes like snow cone and snowmobile and petabyte scale data set in a 50, 55 foot container you can bring in and put it into AWS data center. We can talk about all that. But I think relevant today and really important is to understand Genesis. Amazon Kinesis is your real-time streaming data ingestion tool. Fully managed, serverless, configured, and start ingesting the data. We give you the uh, SDKs, we give you, if you want to deal with it using AWS CLI, you can do that too. Or you can just simply use AWS console, login, and configure it as well. Just click on it, start working. So Kinesis has four flavors. So of course the data stream, which is for data ingestion. We also have video streams, so you can have real-time cameras which might be sending a real-time data feed or video feed into Kinesis, which we can store in AWS as well. And then we have firehose and analytics. Firehose is something similar where firehose can take Kinesis a stream or any stream as an input, and it can batch that data set to store in S3. So you can pretty much get the real-time streaming done, but you can also batch the data set you want to store, or you can uh, write some descriptor or lambda functions on top of it if you want to store everything, right? You want to drop some of the data set, depending upon where you are. And then specifically data analytics, it's really important for e-commerce and other use cases or for real-time analytics use cases, where the real-time data which is coming in, you can run real-time analytics and SQL queries on top of it to make decisions. For example, if you are, uh, if you have a, like, for example, Amazon.com e-commerce, right? How your users are interacting with product catalog, you see on the side or uh, bottom or on the side, you'll see people who bought this, they also bought this. That is real-time analytics because we don't know what product you're going to click when you're on the website. But based on real-time data which is coming in, click a stream, I can analyze this might be important to you as well because thousands of users have bought this as well when they were looking at this. Or, hey Manish, you're on Prime Video, you might also like this because Based on your interest and taste, maybe this, this particular content might be useful to you as well. So all that is done by data analytics, real time. So Kinesis has all the flavors. And then we also have MSK and manage uh, Apache Kafka servers and all that. So we, we support all that. You can run your own Kafka engines if you want. And we give you all that capabilities on EC2. So now that we have done data ingestion, how you're going to stage this data set is important because Ingestion is easy because there is a pipeline which is opened and data is coming in. AWS can scale that pipeline for you. However thick that pipe should be, data will come in. But then how do you store it and stage is really important because if you don't stage it properly, probably this pipeline is not gonna work or the life cycle is gonna fail, right? So one of the things you need to really think is once ingested, where do you want this data set to go? Well, you want it to be staged in S3 as a raw data set, that's fine. 
but you're going to move it somewhere else as well, right? So figure that out, like how it's going to look like. And how long do you want to keep it in S3? We have multiple tiers, uh, frequently used, infrequently used, uh, we have intelligent tiering and all. Think about all those options, how you want to go about it. And then also think about which products and system this data is going to feed into. Whether you're going to be using it for visualization, or you're going to be generating business intelligence out of it. Do you need a data warehouse or not? Figure that out, right? Uh, with a raise of hand, how many of you know what is the difference between a database, data warehouse, and a data lake? And you want to, my <laughs> fellow, do you want to speak about data warehouse maybe? Well, <coughs> database normally you're talking about relational and online transaction processing. You know, the data is, is changing. Data warehouse is more data comes in and doesn't change much once it's there. Uh, the data lake is you know, the data is in raw format and maybe different uh, formats, you know, per day and so on. Yeah, you're right on. So lake, as the name suggests, collect everything, like just dump everything there. And S3 is pretty good at it, right? You can dump anything you want. It's an object storage, at velocity, it scales infinitely, 11 lines, durability, just dump everything in there, right? Data warehouse, where you take the data from your database, and maybe apply some facts and dimensions on top of it, or a storage solution, like how you're gonna store it, so that your end system, like a visualization tool or application can interact with it. And databases, we already know, right? Databases are for real-time applications. You might have heard about OLTP, which is online transaction processing, or OLAP, which is online analytical processing. So that is the difference between a database, which is transactional processing. AP is for analytical processing, which is data warehouse. Data lake is just dump of everything. In just dump it. Excuse me? Um, in data lake, we are talking about we dump it in S3. But in case of data warehouse, which is Redshift, uh, in case of AWS, we do copy it from S3. So not everything. No, but <coughs> normally the way we load the data in data warehouses to run this copy command for S3. But then think about this when you're storing in Redshift, you know the structure you're going to yeah. have. Because While in S3 are... is just a dump, right? You don't know, you're just ingesting video files, PDF files, Word document, binary files. JSON file, all kind of data set, right? And then before you put it in Redshift, you're applying ETL on top of it, and then you're you're giving it a structure yeah, yeah. because you're extracting the data out of it. And that is the intelligence we are talking about. So yeah, but there is Redshift spectrum as well. So if we have data structured in S3, yeah. we don't have to move everything, and we can. True. You can. So yeah, I mean, there are, so she's talking about a couple of tools where you don't need to move. Of course, AWS being AWS, we have other services too, where you don't need to run a full-fledged data warehouse like Redshift, which can be pretty heavy for some customers because you're running clusters and clusters for doing that crunching of that data, right, from your application. So what we have provided as a system on top of Redshift called Redshift Spectrum. In that case, you're not moving the data to Redshift. You're applying that, uh, combining, it. combining that right there in S3 itself and pulling only the relevant data set you need. Similarly, we have Athena as well. You can run Athena queries on top of S3. You don't need to bring it into Redshift to run your quick side dashboard. So yeah, I mean, all those are purpose built. And then, are you susceptible to vendor locking? Like, have you thought about this? Do you want to go to those old guard databases like Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server? I have nothing against them. I'm just saying, like, do you want to lock yourself into a licensing? Or you can just go use Postgres and MySQL with more managed service like RDS, where you can literally take RDS Postgres database and go anywhere you want. You, you're not tying yourself up to a license or, or, or any kind of those vertical and horizontal scalability issues as you will right? So think about all that before you stage your data. One of the tools which we were talking about is staging the data in S3. Uh, I'm not going to harp on this much. You all know probably as what S3 is. 11 line durability, infinitely scalable, dump everything you want, and it gives you out of the box storage lens, observability, and all those nuances built in. And S3 is integrated with all of the AWS services as such. 
Yeah, I think earlier there was a question around like uh, you know um, if I type a, a data, so AWS do provide a lot of tools to help you manage that. And uh, one of it is that you can uh, through Macy scan for sensitive Im information within S3. So if you are storing PI information or certain type, you can actually expose that data to you, so that you can enforce security and access at the to the right people to the right amount of data uh, in S3. So those are some of the capabilities building uh, to help you manage your data uh, in the data lake. Chandu, do you have anything to add? I was going to add, in terms of ecosystem also, right, not just uh, the AWS services, but we also, um, we also integrate with third-party software like Snowflake and Databricks. Yeah, that's a great point. So AWS don't lock you in into the specific services we have. So we give you those services and building blocks where you can combine those together. Like you can use Redshift and Snowflake at the same time. I mean, it's up to you. You can use a new ETL with Snowflake if you want to. You can bring in Snowflake data set into S3, it's up to you. You can send that data set back to as Snowflake, up to you. So we provide you all those bells and whistles. We give you uh, those nuances through which you can move the data around to stage and clean. So once the data is staged, obviously the next step is cleaning. How are you going to clean this data set? And so a couple of questions here to ask yourself is once the data is stored, what are you going to do with it? Why are you cleaning? I mean, before you start cleaning and dropping things and dropping columns and data set or rows and columns, you need to think what are you going to do with this data set? What are you trying to do, right? And what are your ETL requirements? How do you want to load it? Where do you want to load it? Do you want to transform it? Yeah, for one particular use case, I need a particular table. Maybe for another use case, I need another table. Do I, can I combine those tables together and then generate the insight? Or do I need separate databases or tables or whatever, right? So think about all that. And then, like we are already, I think I already gave that hint, like where are you going to place this data set is important. So one of the tools, uh, maybe some of you are uh, already experienced with it, like cleansing with AWS Glue. So Glue is, uh, Glue is our uh, managed ETL service, which is completely serverless. So it gives you all those nuances which you know for many, many years, how do you extract, transform, and load your data set using an ETL tool. And we give you that in the cloud, at the scale, fully managed. And like I said, you, you don't have to manage any servers. And, the, and, and really important aspect here is you only pay for what you're using. You don't pay for running something in the cloud. Because if traditionally, if you think about data centers where you are doing this, you have to continuously buy that infrastructure and run it. And even if managed data centers, you have to still pay for it because you are keeping that, those servers in there and they are depreciating over a period of time. But here you are running it in the cloud and you pay as you go and scale up and down depending upon where you are. There are three flavors of AWS Glue and I think she was, uh, she was touching upon one of those Glue Studio workbook. So different personas and how they interact with those services. So we have Glue, Data Glue, and this is for our business analysts and data scientists. Purpose builder, the kind of UI we serve to these user personas, they are specifically working on the things which are really important to them, on home page, built-in transformation, and how they're interacting with their data set itself. The second, we have uh, Glue Studio. So Studio is for our ETL engineers. So if data engineers are working end-to-end, -end, life cycle of the data itself, ETL engineers are only looking at the data cleansing part. So that is the difference between data engineers and ETL engineers. They're specifically looking at how to extract, transform, and load. They don't have any visibility where this data is going to end up or what not. They get those requirements from data engineers and data scientists, and they work on it. For that, we provide you Glue Studio, where you can write a piece of code, you can go crazy as you want, and then generate those piece of code to act on your data set itself. And then notebooks. Notebooks are specifically for data engineers to look at the data life cycle. How that data is going to be pro progressing from staging to cleansing to where it's going to be landing up. The thing here is you have specific, if you see on the screen itself and the screenshot, look very different. How, you, how they are interacting with data, what is important to them. The kind of charts and graphs and other information is going to be served to these personas is going to be very different. But you have to remember one thing. We are talking about glue. 
whatever you use, whether you use Gloom Studio or Tool or whoever you are, or aren't you wearing all the hats yourself? That's okay as well. But you're interacting with Glue, which is a managed serverless service, which gives you that capability of moving and transforming your data set out of the box. So now that we have cleaned the data and we moved the data around, now it is the time. Now the fun starts because now we are talking about the business. We are off the back office. Now we are talking about business. So you have to ask a few questions here yourself. Once data is clean, what insights are you going to drive out of it? I mean, what SQL statements are you going to run out of it? What is important to you? Because anything and everything you do on this data set now, you're going to be paying for it as well, because you're processing the data set, pulling it into your applications, and doing something with it. So you're moving away from raw storage, cheap data store, or uh, to more qualified, intelligent systems, where you're pulling the data in and doing something with it. So I think it's really important to understand here what insights you're generating. And then how do you give these insights to your customer? Are they going to be logging into a, a quick site dashboard as a reader? Or are you going to be giving them a PDF file which you're going to store somewhere and ship it to them? Or your application is going to be generating a pie chart or a graph or whatnot? So different personas, different tools, think about that. And, and what kind of uh, uh, visualization you're going to do with that. And then the machine learning itself. So not all the data will go into machine learning because you can't send every other data column into your machine learning tool or model, right? So your model might be training on certain feature sets and those features are important to you. So how are you going to stage that data for your machine learning? How are you going to create test and validation sets set for your machine learning? And where it's going to reside is really important. So we have, like we already talked about Redshift, I don't want to speak much here, but Redshift is our, uh, again, purpose-built service for data warehousing at the scale, petabyte scale within, within the cloud. And it can take pretty much any data size. Cluster mm -hmm. and cluster, we have different instance types you can apply, memory intensive, data intensive, or if you don't want to take a decision, we have Redshift serverless. Just, just Ask for it, we'll manage it for you. And then visualization, we talked about QuickSight. QuickSight is very similar to Tableau. Uh, usually, uh, this is most of my customers are using QuickSight because it's easy to use, completely serverless, pay as you go. Uh, you don't pay for what you don't use. You log in, use it for however number of minutes, how many admins or readers are in there, or how many accounts you're subscribing to, you're only paying for that. And then machine learning itself, and I know this is a busy slide, but that's what it is. Like this is all in all the AWS machine learning set or platform or features we are talking about. We think of machine learning into three different layers, and the only thing I'm showing here is the middle layer, which is SageMaker. Because we have infrastructure we always talk about, and then ready to use AI services, which are like out of the box API services, which you can plug in into your application. So I'm not gonna cover those today. This is the middle layer which is SageMaker. So this enables you as an ML engineer or data scientist to build, train, and deploy your ML model on uh, AWS. So if you see the you know, purpose built uh, features, which are prepare phase, build phase, train and tune, and deploy phase. Uh, you were talking about SageMaker Studio, right? So SageMaker Studio is the ID which has everything built into it. You just click and start using those features if you want. And then it has it has built in ML ops and uh, ML pipelines as well. In the prepare section, it does talk about uh, prepare data for ML, which is ETL or directly yep. data rank. That's why I said so. The data which you need for machine learning can look very different what you're sending to Redshift because you don't want to have everything which you want because your model might be specifically driving driving an information out of it saying how many users are gonna in San Francisco might buy this particular product. But you have a data set for the whole world, wide world, right? You don't want to see the Europe data in there, right? Because your, your model is specifically trying to predict something which is useful to North America customers. Or you might be thinking about dropping few columns which are unnecessary for you because what happens is when you're training your models using GPUs or CPUs, you're paying for that. That is one and two there might be some bias in that data set as well, and you don't want to bring that into your training and validation set. 
So there are purpose-built tools, and there, there is a purpose for those like Data Wrangler and other tools there for how to interact with them. So I know this is a busy slide. If you, if you want to talk to me after this, any tool, any product, uh, I'm happy to network with you, and we'll, uh, I specialize in this space. I also, uh, area of depth is analytics as well, so I can talk in depth about anything you want. But now that we have already generated predictions out of it, we analyzed the data set, and we also visualized it, data might become stale after some time. So what are we gonna do? Well, there are some compliance problems, through not, not problems, compliance concerns, because of which you need to keep the data set. Though your systems might not be actively using it, you need to still store it. Like e-commerce website, you need to have seven years of order data, three months of order data within the transactional system, one year of data set into your archive system, or frequently accessed archive system, and maybe seven years of data on a tape type of system where you can tape drive it or archive it in a cold storage. So how do you go about that? So think about, did you already gain enough insight? Is this data becoming stale? What are your compliance requirements? Do you need to keep all the data together, or do we need some of it? Think about e-commerce order. Do you need all the line items, or do you just need the summary on the top, which is the order information? You can drop all the line items. You just need to know how many orders were placed, what was the value, and who was the person this order was shipped. I don't care maybe after a couple of years, like whether they bought a shirt or a t-shirt or a jeans, probably. But depending upon your use case, you can, and like somebody was talking about here, like you can store the data in parquet format or more. So archive systems look very different than analytics and transactional system because you can archive your data set in a much more condensed format than how you store it. And then we have S3 Glacier. So S3 has a, one of the features called Glacier, which is for deep cold storage. It also comes in three flavors, like expedited, retrieval, or cold storage, like where you can live with 24 hours of uh, uh, access time, or, or if you can tolerate that kind of accessibility as it is, then you use that. But extremely low cost, I think it's 0 0.00099, something like that. I think it's more, yeah, uh, yeah maybe. Yeah. yeah, one one dollar a terabyte, keeping that data set there, like, I mean, <laughs> you can't get cheaper than that in cloud. And then you can access it on the fly, like, you can just bring in that data set anytime into your application if required. You don't need to ship your tapes, which takes a week to receive, and then plug it into your server and start getting that data set to use it with your application. Maybe just ask uh, a quick question. Who here is uh, familiar with Glacier or is using Glacier or has used Glacier in the past? Family. Okay. Okay. How many uh, GK? How many class storage classes of Glacier do we have? How many what? Uh, storage classes. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. When you're in the kitchen, right? And, and suppose you're making a coffee or a tea, right? So if you're making tea every day, you know a specific area where you keep your cup. And here you have the coffee thing and the coffee machine, right? Same for But if you are making a juice, or you need a juicer which you use maybe every 15 days, you might have put it somewhere else, right? So something similar he's talking about. Even though you are archiving your data set, you can keep it in different tiers. If you don't, even if you are paying very low, you can pay even lower, depending upon where you store it. So cold storage versus regular storage can have a very different SLAs and the cost associated with it. Yeah. I think one important point in that is that what is the minimum uh, commitment of storage? There is no commitment. You can, you can leave your... I so there is a minimum uh, retention time. period, but I wanted to bring out that uh, in the past people may think that Glacier is count only one storage class and it's always offline. But Glacier now actually have three storage classes. There's Glacier Instant Retrieval, uh, Glacier uh, Flexible Retrieval, and Glacier Deep Archive. And the first one, Glacier Instant Retrieval, is actually an online access. So it's, it's on a spinning disk, there's no waiting for data to be restored. It is basically as fast as uh, S3 when you, I get an uh, uh, object get. But uh, it is kind of tailored towards uh, low cost for storage, but there's a little bit higher retrieval cost. So you definitely don't want to keep hot data in it, but if you have cold data and you want a low cost storage, but still want to get that instant access, we actually have a Glacier Instant Retrieval that is available. So I just wanted to uh, point it out. I think uh, 
another important point would be like how the data is loaded in, into our mind. Can, can we directly load it from anywhere or does it have to go into the standard storage and then we can move it there? Yeah, there, there's two ways. Uh, so if you already have a data in S3 standard, you can set up a life, life cycle policy. So let's say after 30, 60, 90 days, it will carry it down into, for example, Glacier Instant Retrieval. However, when you do an object put, you can actually directly specify <coughs> the storage class. So you can actually put an object directly into the storage class that you want. And that includes Glacier. You can directly put it into the archive. Within, yeah, if you use the S3 API for an uh, object pool, you can specify the storage class. Yeah. Thank you. So, I don't have any more presentations. Um, I think, Mark, we have your clear again. Oh, no, we'll come back to that at the very end. After Later? The okay. Yeah. So, now the fun part, the workshop. Okay. So next time I'm going to show a scenario to you, we'll take a pause, you can read through it. After you read that scenario, we're going to take a break, bio break, and then we'll assemble in the same room again. Uh, let me count two, four, five.